On today's episode of the Nerd by Word podcast, we're getting ready for the inevitable apocalypse. We're talking producing the end of the world with Mario Candelaria. Welcome into episode 77 of the Nerd by Word podcast. On today's episode, we are sitting down and talking Producing the End of the World, an anthology by brought to you by Soda and Telepass with one of the contributing writers, Mario Candelaria. But first, it is time for... Nerd News! Dave, do we need to call a plumber? Uh, you know, I'm just going to tell you, man, uh, th- this is the part of the episode where spoiler uh, alert is in full effect. Um, if you've not been hanging out on social media all that much, let me just tell you, we're getting ready to talk about Spider-Man No Way Home leaks. So here we go. Uh, recently, uh, we came across a couple of images on social media that are supposedly leaks from Uh, the movie Spider-Man No Way Home. Now, all our fans are no doubt aware that uh, we've had a lot of speculation over the last several months regarding this movie and what all is included in it, given that it introduces the multiverse to the MCU. The biggest, of course, points of contention in all of this have been whether we see Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield, respectively, uh, both reprising their roles as their version of Spider-Man and have a basic three Spider-Man crossover. Uh, The other thing that has been heavily speculated is that we will see the return of Charlie Cox as Daredevil in this movie, as Peter Parker Spider-Man is in desperate need of a lawyer, and so it seems like this would be a natural place to introduce him if he will be, in fact, introduced into the MCU proper on the big screen. Um, Now, obviously, uh, this speculation has been given at least some credence after the release of the first No Way Home trailer, which prominently featured the return of Alfred Molina's Dr. Octopus, and also hinted heavily on the inclusion uh, of a returning Willem Dafoe as Green Goblin. So there seemed to be sort of the groundwork laid for this multiversal mashup. So here then is the spoiler alert. Two images in particular caught our eye on social media. The first of these sees uh, a roundtable discussion between Happy Hogan, May Parker, Peter Parker, and yes, Daredevil himself, Charlie Cox, uh, which seems to confirm that this is indeed something that will happen in the movie. Uh, The second and probably the most significant, however, is a scene that shows three unmasked Spider-Man standing together, looking at something off screen. And yes, they are, in fact, Tom Holland, Tobey Maguire, and Andrew Garfield. Now, if these are, in fact, screenshots of the movie No Way Home, then this, of course, confirms that this is going to be one whopper of a movie bringing back past Spider-Man from the Sony-produced Spider-Man movies, which I think a lot of fans are hoping and anticipating. It's basically the worst-kept secret of MCU history. But again, it's sometimes hard to tell because uh, homemade photo manipulation has come a long way. So it is difficult to tell, at least at this stage, if these are, in fact, uh, you know, actual screenshots from the movie or if this is some kind of photo manipulation. I will say that if this is true, I am extremely excited for both of these scenarios. I'm a huge fan of Charlie Cox in the role as Daredevil. Uh, he's my Daredevil, basically, and I would love to see him on the big screen Um, kind of bumping elbows with various other members of the MCU. And although Tobey Maguire is probably not my favorite Spider-Man, he did feature in probably one of the best Spider-Man movies, which is Spider-Man 2. And I'm a huge Andrew Garfield fan. I think his Peter Parker is vastly underrated. So seeing both of those actors sort of reprise their roles would be, I think, a real treat for fans of the character. So... Here's hoping that these leaks are accurate. Chris, what are your thoughts? I I really just hate how spoiled we've become as a society in that, Dave, this movie is coming out next month, right? It's being released in theaters. And we can't wait a month? A month. 
like we've been given a trailer like like you said it's the worst kept secret in the history of the marvel cinematic universe like you couldn't wait a month you have to have some grainy zapruder film type footage uh, whether this is 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 indeed true or whatnot, it's just like these are the kids that search every parent their parents' closets looking for every Christmas present. I guess I was just like the weird kid that like didn't want to know. I like being surprised. Like I feel kind of robbed of the moment on screen and seeing all these things brought together. So and it feels kind of cheapened in a way. And uh, why are we so obsessed with leaks and doing all these things? It's just frustrating for me. Um, you know, we, we had some critics who were leaking eternal spoilers, like as soon as they saw it. And, you know, most folks on social media were having to mute everything that was even close to being related to eternals. Uh, it's just incredibly frustrating where we've come as a society that we can't just be patient for literally a month. It's not like this movie is a year away and, we're just trying to whet our appetites or anything. It's literally a couple weeks away and we can see it for ourselves. It's just extremely frustrating. And I will totally agree with that. And though it is difficult for me to look away, um, given my excitement for this movie, I, I wholeheartedly echo your sentiments about leaks uh, and spoilers. I think if they try to pull an Empire Strikes Back twist in this day and age, it would be leaked six months before the movie releases. Right. Um, it, it's it, extremely sad that we don't get to have those kinds of moments anymore. Imagine if there would have been no leaks, no no Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield speculation. Imagine the moment then when those Spider-Men pop up on screen for the first time in the movie. Like there would have been screaming in the aisles. There have been Spider-Man fans passing out. Like this, this is like the holy grail of Spider-Man dumb to put these three actors together in a movie. And and now we know, and you know, we know ahead of time, and most people know it's almost impossible to avoid on social media at this point. It's extremely regrettable. Um, I, I think we may have reached a point where there are no true surprises left uh, in cinema. And, and that's really, really sad. Well, even staying within the same property, remember the shock and the dumbfoundedness we we felt at the end of No Way Home when we saw J.K. Simmons come back as J. Jonah Jameson. And, you know, sticking with that, that's another Marvel role. And I wholeheartedly back you on this. If Charlie Cox is not set to reprise the role of Matt Murdock, uh, Matt Murdock Daredevil, just don't do it. Just don't do it. And, you know, I think one of the one of the things that the Garfield Superman or excuse me, Garfield Spider-Man movie suffered from that was a Freudian slip that I'll explain in a moment is a lack of JJJ, one of the founding members of that supporting cast. But at the same time, you can't recast that. And if J.K. Simmons was unavailable or was above their pay grade, then just don't do it. You know, and I feel the exact same way with Charlie Cox. So if this is indeed true, I'll set my frustration aside and, and just comment the fact that I'm very excited if this is indeed true. Um, and the reason I had that slip before uh, just a moment ago is because I feel the exact same way I've made no bones about it. Andrew Garfield is my favorite on screen Peter Parker with, uh, you know, Tom Holland finishing a very close one a slash second. Um, I feel the same way that I do about Andrew Garfield as I do about Henry Cavill as Superman. So that's why I had the slip before. I feel like they are perfectly cast and they are surrounded by a lot of muck when it comes to whether it's the script or the supporting cast or the direction of the film and the plot. Something is just weighing them down and they are perfectly cast in those roles. And I've been a big fan of both Garfield and Cavill in subsequent projects. I'm looking at you, Witcher season two coming out next month too. We're going to be eating good, Dave, but uh, oh, I yeah. can't wait. So if this is indeed true, I'm very excited, but at the same time frustrated. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I wholeheartedly echo your sentiment about Henry Cavill as well. Um, yeah, just I just want a good movie, man. I just want to see this movie and really sit down and enjoy it. And I hope that we're not completely um, spoiled on all surprises, and we can sit down and truly enjoy what look is looking to shape up to be really one heck of a Spider-Man movie. All right, Chris, what brings you into the nerd newsroom today? Okay, so I'm gonna have to bite my tongue because I saw Eternals, and I'm gonna hold that reaction um, for our our review. 
but um, it, it's been no secret that um, been been a lot of mixed reviews, even Rotten Tomatoes, a rotten score. But take with that what you will. A lot of those are review bombs um, that is very similar to what we saw with Captain Marvel. In this case, a very openly LGBTQ superhero. And, you know, the homophobes just can't help themselves to review bomb that for no other reason than just that. Um but one thing that is indisputable is that Lauren Ridloff's character of Makari has been a breakaway, pun fully intended, she's a speedster, star of this film. And this has led to a significant surge in people wanting to learn sign language as the first deaf superhero, not in not only the MCU, but as far as I know, in mainstream superhero uh, films at large. So... Um, you know, according to The Independent, um, individual searches saw on, on prep, according to research on Preply, there's been a 250% spike in searches for, quote, learn sign language for beginners as excitement surrounding Chloe Zhao's film grew in the last year. And the search for Lauren Ridloff herself has increased 550%. So this is really, really cool. And just another feather in the cap of what it means to have proper representation for people of different backgrounds of different, you know, health conditions. Um, also there's a video circulating around of um, Salma Hayek that is, is in Spanish. So if you need a translator, hit me up, but just details the mm -hmm. fact that she saw herself as, you know, someone of uh, Latina origin of a middle Eastern background and seeing herself um, in a superhero costume for the first time brought tears to her eyes. And it made, you know, the interviewers who are also of Latinx background cry. Just uh, that's the importance of representation and realizing, you know, we're two cishet white guys, but seeing other people from other backgrounds and other experiences being represented on screen is just so powerful and it's so moving. Yeah, so everything that Ju just said has made me even more excited to actually sit down and watch The Eternals and get a sense for this movie. Um, you know, I've I've not been without my critiques, visually speaking, because I'm a big fan of Kirby, but I am always excited to see, you know, a real artist uh, kind of take on material like this and try to reinterpret and reimagine. So I'm very excited for what I've seen so far, and I just everything you've said now just heightened my excitement. I really just want to sit down and, and get to know these characters and get to know this movie better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like I said, I'm going to bite my tongue until we get to a proper review of this, but um, it is really cool um, to see the reaction to this in this particular aspect, uh, especially. All right, that wraps up nerd news for this week. When we come back from this, our first break, we're going to hit you with our Byword Big Talk featuring Mario Candelaria, one of the contributing writers to Producing the End of the World, which is going to hit Kickstarter here November the 12th. Stick around. All right, welcome back to the meat and potato segment of this episode. You know it as... Today we are joined by none other than Mario Candelaria. He is one of the contributing writers on this anthology that is coming from Soda and Telepass, uh, producing the end of the world. Mario, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me. So our first question with each new guest is always the same. What's your nerd origin story? What were the formative bits of media that set you on this path? Yeah, yeah. Uh... This is a great question. Uh, I've been reading comics for as long back as I can remember. Uh, before I could even read, actually, I had comics. I remember having the Count Ducula books and Police Academy comics, uh, you know, and just <laughs> checking that out. Um, you know, I, I grew up in New York City, and we had a corner store that my mom always went to, and they, of course, had the magazine stand. And as a knee-high kid, you would always gravitate towards the colorful, shiny, you know, uh, comics, uh, Heathcliff, things like that. 
And then it wasn't until I was a little older I started getting into Spider-Man. I think it was the Eric Larson Revenge of the Sinister Six Spider-Man. It was one of the first things I could actually read. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, from there, I just, you know, I it, I took off. I think um, my first real crossover was the Infinity War. Okay. I remember buying that off the wall. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you asked about uh, formative bits of media. I mean, definitely Marvel Comics, Maximum Carnage, books like that. Uh, but then, of course, the the toxic <laughs> the toxic crusader uh, cartoon, <laughs> and subsequently, uh, which got me in a lot of trouble as a very young child, the Toxic Avenger movie because I thought it would be a live action version of the cartoon, and it absolutely was not. Yeah, not even remotely. <laughs> no, no, I got I got I, I got punished for it. I'm like, mom, you think I made this? No, but yeah. <laughs> So what influenced uh, your decision to become a writer? And and who would you say are your greatest influences as a creator? I've always kind of been a storyteller, just, you know, naturally, just, you know, when you're in a group setting and you're recounting something that happened and, you know, you try to get everyone's attention to tell the most grandiose version of of that. Uh, I, I, I learned that from the old guys in the neighborhood. But um I think just seeing the media around me and then starting to get ideas of my own when I was in middle school, like Star Wars and also, you know, taking creative writing courses in high school uh, where they're asking you to come up with your own things. Um, that from there felt like something that was natural to me. Uh, big influences I have. Um, Terrence Winter from television. He did Boardwalk Empire and The Sopranos. He's probably my biggest influence uh jonathan ames he's a fantastic writer he has done a few tv shows like hbo's bored to bored to death but he also did a bunch of comics including the alcoholic with dean haspiel with from vertigo that's one of my all-time favorite graphic novels of all time but then also you know scott liddell you know creators like that from the 90s era of of marvel and then you know bendis in the 2000s was a big influence what he did bringing marvel together in one cohesive kind of justice league style unit okay so i have a few trigger words and stand-up comedy is one of them and your bio <laughs> includes stand-up comedian I, you could be a nerd of many things as we say on the show quite often i'm a huge yeah. nerd of stand-up comedy and i'd be re- i'd be remiss if i didn't ask you about that yeah please tell me you googled it please oh no i did not <laughs> i have uh, i have a few old bits on my uh on my website and on my YouTube page. I mean, very old when um, I did the comedy cellar like 10 years ago and I recorded, I was so nervous doing the cellar. I love that place. But uh, yeah, I used to be a stand-up comic in New York. Um, I mean, that that's, that's a legendary scene, New York stand-up. I mean, Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. It was, it, it was a lot of fun. It's something I've always wanted to do. And I saw um, one day my old roommate, Randy Humphrey invited me out to a show that he was doing. And I was like, oh, if this guy can do it, I can do it. So I wasn't really uh, <laughs> doing it for, uh, you know, trying to pursue a passion as much as like kind of a rivalry that I had with him. But uh, I've always loved stand up. I would always watch the uh, the Comedy Central half hour specials that they had. Yes. Uh, I'd always go on HBO and watch their stuff. Uh, now, of course, it's transformed to Netflix and YouTube for the most part. But yeah. Yeah. Um, I love going to clubs in any major city I go to. I wanna, when I'm in LA, I go to the comedy sell- store. When I'm in New York, it's the comedy seller. I mean, I just, I love it. It's, uh... Do you have any personal faves? Uh, Liza Schlesinger, really good. Uh, Whitney Cummings, of course. Uh, Sebastian uh, yeah. Maniscalco. Sebastian Maniscalco is so funny. That guy yes. does, like he does old, like old neighborhood stuff, like the guys that I grew up around. Right, and he really just takes the universal isms of them. Even though he's from Chicago and I'm from New York, he takes the isms of just ah the essence of that. Uh, yeah, uh, geez, there's so many. Um, Pete Davidson's funny, uh, but I think uh, Pete Davidson continues to cash in that sense of humor. Apparently, <laughs> I did a show with him once at the stand. Really? Yeah, uh, I had no idea who he was. Um, that was when he was doing Guy Code for MTV. <laughs> I, wow. like, I, I just like i i just said some random bs to him as we're all waiting to you know like for our stage time that's the only that's my only claim to fame i think is talking to pete davidson once so you are also the uh the second mad cave award winner that we've had the pleasure of speaking with after friend of the show jared lujan uh what piece uh garnered you that honor and what was that process like 
Oh yeah. Um, the whole Mad Cave thing has been awesome. I'm not going to lie. It's, it was, uh, from beginning to even now, just a surprise. Um, you guys know when 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 they do their open calls for submissions, they have kind of a preset thing to build stories within their world. So I had studied about four or five different Mad Cave books, just trying to mine every single panel, every single word balloon for some nugget that I could form into a story. Uh, and in doing that, I found um, two books that were unrelated: uh, Show's End and Southern Bastards. And Southern Bastards took place in the late 1800s, while Show's End took place in the early 1900s. And I felt like there was this one moment that could kind of sort of be set in the same world. So I took the bad guy from, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I took the bad guy from Show's End, uh, Crowley, I believe his name was, and I kind of gave him an origin story that was a scene from the beginning of Southern Bastards. And I guess the the editors, the the Chris's, and also um, Mark London, they really liked that, just how I took two unrelated things and pieced them together to make a story. And I believe that is what Mark said got me the spot. Now, you've also had work published with Action Lab, and they've made some unfortunate headlines as of late. Many creators have had a tumultuous, uh, tumultuous relationship with that company, particularly here in the last year. Has that been your experience as well? Uh, not a hundred percent. My work with Action Lab was from the past, and that was done through a project I had done with Red Stylo Media for an anthology, uh, Twenty Seven Club, which then Action Lab picked up after the fact and produced. We still worked closely with them to, you know, make any changes or adjustments. Uh, the Action Lab guys I worked with have been cool. Uh, I don't believe any of them are still there. I did have a deal that almost went through before the pandemic with them for a series, um, but you know. It, just things just don't work out, unfortunately. And then, of course, in recent months, just, you know, seeing uh, both in public and private, seeing things that my friends are going through. Uh, it's really eye opening, but, you know, not too surprising knowing a lot of deals that are out there for comic creators across multiple publishers. But um, yeah, the Action Lab stuff has been <laughs> that has been a wild trip. Just every time I see notification in right. certain friend groups and chat rooms, just it's uh i mean, i think uh you guys spoke about jared being a friend of the show he's one of the more vocal right proponents of of this um yeah i don't have as much direct hand experience as he does you know but you know i'm there with him and i support him every step of the way so as an independent creator you undoubtedly have heard about the groundbreaking development of comic book workers united making their voices heard what was your reaction when that news broke? Yeah, I thought that was really cool. I shared, like, as soon as I saw the link pop up on Twitter, I shared that in one of my uh, chat groups that I have. And, you know, we were just talking about that more and more. It's, I feel like it's a good first step. I believe right now it, the, the union is just covering the employees who do the production for Image, correct? I don't believe it's the independent creators. But... You know, uh, baby steps, right? You got to walk before you can run. And I mean, if you look at Hollywood or any real industry out there, there are unions protecting their creators from the directors to the producers guild all the way down to the writers guild and even just teamsters. So this is just another, another leg of the entertainment industry. And, uh, you know, you can't, you can't put up something like that forever. I mean, if it's possible it could happen in my lifetime, but this is definitely uh, one of the more grandiose opening steps I've seen or read about in the history of, of this moving towards uh, unionization. Do you think, I mean, the the irony is inescapable of, of it being people who work for Image Comics. You know, they famously break off in the 90s and then they they issue this statement where they're not going to publicly recognize it. Do you think that, that this is going to be a long-standing thing? Uh, you know, honestly, I wish I knew more about unions <laughs> to, to discuss right. about this. I mean, I know I know a lot about unions from, like, you know, the uh, just the old guys in the neighborhood, you know, the electricians and stuff, uh, right. and how they have, you know, the, uh, the Teamster bosses. I know things like that in the meetings. As far as how they go work with a – with a company that's not already signed on to it, I unfortunately can't speak too much on that. I already, my my area of expertise only really comes from a knowledge of 
companies that already have unions in place, and that's just the status quo. Right. All right, folks, our main event, the reason we're here today, Producing the End of the World. This is an anthology brought together by Soda and Telepass that features 18 stories by 18 writers and 12 artists, which is launching here on Kickstarter November the 12th. What can you tell us about it, and how did you become? Uh, how did you come to be involved in this project, Mario? Yeah, this was uh, this is a really cool project that came across. I just happened to be scrolling on Twitter one night, uh, like I do all day long anyway, uh, <laughs> and I saw I saw an open call that Anthony put out asking for uh, you know contributors. So I you know immediately got to work. Uh, producing the end of the world sounds like such a grand title that I am immediately just had a specific vision in mind. I don't know how far I can uh, go go into it, uh, but I tend to look at more of the business analytics things, uh, excuse me, the business <laughs> analytics side of things. And that's what my story geared towards. It's not necessarily something of an event taking place like you see, you know, um, Mount Vesuvius exploding or the comet coming to Earth, but as much as looking at it from a business side of what could cause something like that to happen. Why do you think uh, apocalyptic events and the end times have been such a never-ending fount of content production in pop culture? Are we that transfixed with our own mortality? What do you think that is all about? Yeah, I mean, 100%. Everybody, nobody knows what happens when we die, and the only way you're going to find out is when it happens and you won't be able to tell anybody right so uh there's always stories that involve some type of doom and heroics or even just survival because as a human race going back to the bedrock of like mythology we uh, we had stories that included that level of you know change and chaos and some either someone emerging triumphant or some lesson to be learned in a grander scale, you know, through metaphors. Um, it's a tale as old as time, to be honest, uh, looking back and just, you know, going forward. Um, I mean, if you look at Hollywood, they have, they had two movies about an asteroid hitting earth coming out at the same time. I mean, you know, who does yeah. that? they both, they both hit, I mean, joke unintended, but you know, they, uh, you know, <laughs> They both became hits and, you know, there's, there's enough, there's enough room at that table for everyone to eat, I feel. And the more stake, the more stakes they are, I feel that everybody's ramping it up now. The, uh, the more eyes and attention to try to get that bigger bang. So, yeah. Yeah. Stop me if you've heard this before, but a young adult novel that is based in post-apocalyptic times. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Uh, Clearly, you're talking about Divergent, right? Uh, yeah, or Hunger Games, <laughs> or you know, so many others. Oh, the Maze Runner, yes, that's a good yeah, one. right. <laughs> so, uh, you you teased a little bit, but can you tell us anything more about the story that you contributed here? Yeah, so I teamed up with my buddy uh, Jay Sheik. I love that guy. We have worked on a number of things. We're working on a number of more things to come. Uh, this is a. From the preview page, uh, it's a boardroom conversation uh, that's pre-apocalyptic, but it definitely ramps up fairly quickly in, in just the dialogue of how things kick off. I, I literally took the producing and producing the end and went that way with it. So you went extremely literal. They are literally <laughs> producing it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, my job, my, my, my nine to five, uh, you know, Monday world job is it, it's a lot of business stuff. It's a lot of looking at right. data. It's a lot of discussing things and saying, how can we get from point A to point B? So I think this is the first real time that I took an approach like that in my creative writing. And I think that's one of the fascinating things, you know, in reviewing the the press copy that, that we received from Soda and Telepaths is, is you can take something like this, a premise like this and go, completely different directions i mean the week we've got we've got the board meeting that you referenced in there um you've got something that is like uh pretty pretty ancient times like i got i got mad like babylon vibes from that and then uh you also have like a fisherman's tale like there's so many different ways that you could go off of this yeah um i mean (laughs) 
every generation feels that their generation is going to be the last one, right? Going all the way back to the Bible. So, you know, uh, you could definitely take any point in history and make some type of chaotic world-ending event, I feel. We've, we've been through, what, five uh, five extinction events on Earth? I mean, come on. The planet will be around for at least one more, I think. <laughs> Do you know anything about the different rewards and tiers for backers on this project? Um, unfortunately, not as much as I probably should, considering it launches in a few days. Uh, but I know that we are talking about getting uh, scripts from writers. Um, that was more of my end of it when seeing what I could personally contribute. Uh, I I can't I can barely draw breath. I let alone you know a figure so i can't draw anything unfortunately for people but i know that i can give like a uh, a script sample so that way people could see what the writing looks like before it gets to the art stage now with soda and telepath uh soda and telepath being based in australia you're on the east coast and nyc of the united states um what is the collaborative process of something global like this this is not even taking into the account uh the the artists that you're collaborating with yeah, uh, I mean, they're definitely with you know Anthony in Australia. There definitely is a little bit of friction there because I think he's waking up either now or in a little bit, and while well, I'm going to be getting ready to go to sleep. So I mean, I'm not going to sleep at five o'clock. I'm not you know seventy, but you know what I mean. Uh, it's one of the <laughs> You've already had your uh, early bird dinner. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, he's living in the future right now. This is tomorrow for him, and I'm still you know in today. Uh, so there's that. But you know, thank God we have things like messenger where we can send a message and you will see it when you wake up or he'll see it when he wakes up. Uh, it's just, it's not, there's only a certain windows of immediate back and forth. And we do try to make that time work, but with, I mean, I've been dealing with people across the globe for a few years now. It's just learning to adapt and setting that expectation of knowing where your collaborators generally are and having spatial awareness. Um, Jay, he's based out in California right now. So that's easy to, you know, three hours behind isn't so bad in terms of, you know, collaborating with him. But um, I'm working on a different thing where I have my illustrator is in London and my colorist is in Brazil and I'm here in America. (laughs) So, yeah, um, the Internet has definitely connected a whole new slew of creators to, I guess, in previous generations wouldn't have had that type of availability in the past. So, yeah, I mean. (laughs) <laughs> long answer short uh it's pretty easy you know the internet's a great thing thank you al gore <laughs> <laughs> i will say that this is pro that's probably been the most eye-opening thing about like running this podcast and we've been going a year plus but like just lining up interviews dave does like the behind the scenes stuff and i do social uh social media and like lining up interviews and stuff so then like you're like okay awesome we'll meet at five and then we're like what time zone are you i was like oh um yeah so then when we got paired up with you and you're like eastern time zone i'm like hey friends <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean I'm, I'm sure you saw my communication i am i'm very conscious now to be very specific on where i am in the world Right. So that way there's no doubt and no question as to mix up. Uh, I think this happened once with Anthony and I, where I didn't realize he was in Australia. I thought he was in London. So he said some time and I was like, oh, cool. I'll just subtract five hours. <laughs> right. And I got a message from him at like four in the morning asking where I was. I was like, oh, you're on that part of the world. I thought you meant this part. So, yeah, um, it's a lot of, like I said, just being aware of who is where and, you know, adjusting things accordingly. Uh, communication is key. Of course, uh, you know, tell your time zones and tell your availabilities, but, you know, try to be flexible and work with people as best as you can as well. Yeah, there was one, I think, Dave, we were sitting there waiting and waiting for the interview and they're like, and and then the guest was like, you know, I'm Pacific time. And I was like, oh, God, I totally forgot to even consider that. Yeah, man, yeah. Was, 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 the, was that Brian Q. Miller? I feel like it was like yes. Brian Q. Miller or somebody yes. like that. Yeah. Yep. It, that's exactly who it was. Yeah, that, that one was an eye opener. Yeah. And I was so excited for that interview, too. I was a big fan that of his was, to begin yeah. with. <laughs> yep. All right. So, Mario, do you have any other upcoming projects that you feel you can like tease our audience about a little bit? Oh, absolutely. I have a ton. Um, the big one that I can talk about that I'm excited for is Kill Cella. It's a four-issue slasher horror series I have coming from Scout next year. Um, Ooh, I'm there. I have, 
<laughs> Thank you. It's uh, Scout Comics. Yeah. Scout Comics too. <laughs> yeah, Scout Comics. Those guys have been awesome with me. Uh, yeah, I have um, Serge Acuna and his wife Kath Lobo on art, as well as uh, Lotaro Havlovich and Leslie Atlansky coming in for the remaining issues. Um, yeah, this has been an awesome experience. It's my most hyped story uh, that people are looking forward to. Thankfully. Um, yeah, I feel that just years of working on comics has led to this, and I'm hoping that this could be uh, the one thing that pushes me to uh, to another level. I also, uh, looking at your website, this Good Fight cover that you contributed to, I think that's a Christian Ward cover. It's one of the most stunning and like stops you right where you are covers I've ever seen in comic books. Yeah, I mean, just uh, the person screaming in the person's face, that's definitely an amazing visual, uh, especially given what was happening in the world at that time and still going on. It is a powerful imagery. Mario, thank you so much for your time. Where can our fans and listeners go to support you and your work? Yeah, um, mainly you can find me on Twitter. It's uh, at the other Mario C. I do post on Instagram quite a bit, but it's not as interactive as Twitter as far as sharing work and links. But I am another Mario C, and you can go to my website, uh, theothermariocc.com. We love the easiness and the branding. Uh, Mario, thank you so much for your time. Folks, November the 12th, uh, producing the end of the world. Be sure to head over to Kickstarter and support this project. Hey, thank you for having me. All right, special thanks to Mario Candelaria for joining us. Uh, be sure to head over to Kickstarter. Again, that's November the 12th and support producing The End of the World from Soda and Telepass, one of their final anthologies. When we come back from this, our final break, we're going to be coming with uh, two more nerd commendations. All right, we are here for our final segment And Dave, between you and my friend Michael from X of Words family, um, I really depend on you guys for reading lists when it comes to DC. It looks like you got another one for me. All right. So uh, I'm obviously a big fan of 90s comic books. I think the uh, the era has been much maligned because of certain events like, oh, you know, something like the Clone Saga. But there is so much good stuff that came out of the 90s. Uh, two characters that I really enjoyed that hit sort of a high point in the 90s uh, was Tim Drake Robin and uh, Connell Superboy, the clone of Superman. Uh, and during the 1996 year, we got some really fantastic stuff, including a two-book crossover between Superboy and Robin called World's Finest Three. And what the wonderful thing is about this is that uh, they actually got the writers of the two respective solo series to collaborate on this two-parter. Uh, Chuck Dixon, who was writing uh, Robin at the time, and Carl Kessel, who was writing Superboy at the time. And of course, the whole thing was uh, penciled by Tom Grummet, whose art is absolutely gorgeous here. Scott Hanna did the inks, and Ken Lopez uh, was the letterer. Scott Bauman was the colorist on this one. And uh, the book just looks gorgeous. I picked this one up actually out of a dollar bin. Both book one and book two of the story were present. And uh, it, it's about as classic as a superhero crossover tale as it gets. Two completely different opposites uh, attract kind of characters get together. And over the course of having to fend off some supervillains, uh, form a friendship. The whole thing starts when Superman villain Metallo, who is, of course, powered by a kryptonite heart, shows up in Gotham City, where he decides to lift uh, some nuclear material to help power himself. Robin, of course, completely overwhelmed, tries to get in contact with Superman since Batman is out of town and can't get a hold of Superman, so then settles ultimately for Superboy. In the course of the story, they believe they have defeated Metallo only for Poison Ivy to show up and use her mind control. It doesn't take much with Superboy during this era when a lady is involved. Using her mind control to woo Superboy and gain control of him. Uh, the action moves in the second book then to Hawaii, where Robin is forced to somehow try to free Superboy from Poison Ivy's clutches. You know, like I mentioned earlier, this is really a classic 
uh, sort of superhero crossover story. And it is one of the foundational books for what would later become Peter David's Young Justice. Here, of course, we have the first meeting between Robin and Superboy. Uh, later on, of course, you uh, add Impulse to the mix and then Wonder Girl, and you start seeing Young Justice slowly take shape. Uh, it's a great story. It looks gorgeous. It features all of the best stuff about DC during the 90s, and they really did have a lot of good stuff going on during this time period. Tim Drake and Superboy definitely being two of those. And so I, I just highly nerd commend this. It's a, a great sort of a done-in-one story that still actually totally holds up both in the writing and in the visuals. So I'm a big fan of this one, and I'm really glad I picked up both books out of the dollar bin. It's really amazing how these two legacy characters, even with different iterations, different people taking up the mantle, can really deliver this, I guess, reluctant buddy cop type of book. Because I love the iteration uh, uh, with Jonathan Kent and uh, Damian Wayne that we see in something like Rebirth, and then even now with... Uh, the current John Kent book from Tom Taylor and company. Like, it's just crazy how they can kind of play off of each other. And that's, that's a fascinating thing. Not so much in the young justice animation uh, animated series. Uh, of course, I'm still in season one and uh, Superboy is still going through a lot of development. It's still pretty wooden or, or cardboard, if you will. So not a lot of personality coming from Superboy, but uh, that prison break episode helped out quite a bit. But um, definitely going to have to check this one out because uh, 90s DC comics are not my area of expertise, although uh, Morrison's JLA is helping me in that regard. You know, it really cracks me up too, uh, since you made the comparison between John and Damien and, and, and Tim and Kamel here. But I absolutely adore that the two dynamics are completely different and yet at right, the same right, time right. feature the same kind of um, opposites, you know, buddy cop kind of thing. Like the, the you know, in with the dynamic between Damien and John, you have Damien, the stick in the mud, overly serious. Uh, and then John, this really earnest do-gooder. Now you go ahead and look at something uh, with Tim Drake and, and Superboy here. You have Tim Drake, the earnest do-gooder, and Superboy, sort of this this over-the-top glory hound womanizer, uh, or at least a womanizer in his own mind, really. Uh, so they play off completely different, and at the same time... It all works. Both It all works. Both iterations work perfectly. That's exactly right, Chris. All right, Chris, what are you nerd commending this week for us? All right, so this is kind of uh, an addendum that I'm filing. A couple weeks ago, uh, we talked about the the revamp, the remodeling of the Marvel Unlimited app. And one of those innovations were these new Infinity comics. So I'm just here to nerd commend them properly. Um, so there's a lot of different titles. You've got an X-Men one that was written first couple issues by Jonathan Hickman, taken up by Jerry Duggan. There's a Captain America one, a Shang-Chi one, Black Widow. Uh, there's this new spine tingling Spider-Man ones that I can't wait to dive into. There's, um, there's a, a little Marvels one by Scotty Young. There's one about Jeff the Landshark that is taking the internet fandom by storm. Um, so yeah, these are just a really fun addition that really makes this subscription worth it. Uh, these are exclusive to a Marvel Unlimited subscription, and for nine ninety nine a month, or you can even save a little bit if you do a yearly subscription. Um, it really makes it worthwhile. Similar to the digital first stuff that DC is doing on their side, but um, also really innovative with like the scroll, scroll, scroll style. You're not turning pages here, so that really gives the storytellers, uh, particularly the artists, some real agency to to play with some different types of tools. And that's kind of cool, just being able to read on your phone or tablet and just scroll down. And, you know, somebody falling out of a window is a very different rendering in this style. So I'm really, really enjoying what I'm reading so far. Uh, Nature Girl seems to be down pretty bad um, in the X-Men comics, but that, particularly that spine-tingling Spider-Man one, I'm, I'm excited to check out. Yeah, I'm very interested in this, in particular because of what you just mentioned about the artist having, you know, agency and being able to experiment. I think that's the one thing in digital comics, at least, that's still missing, is that so much of what we, we've been seeing digitally is still beholden to 
uh, the the page format and the page dimensions uh, of a physical comic book. And I, I think it's high time that some publishers start experimenting more with that and breaking free of that format because yeah, so many different opportunities, uh, so many different things that you can do when you're you know doing it for a screen when you know page length is is not you know really a thing anymore page width when you can really really cut loose a little bit and and play with that particularly that vertical space i think i would i'm fascinated by that I mean, that really is what piqued my interest most about what you just said chris yeah there's also um here's some more great titles spider-man loves mary jane which is kind of bringing it back to that ultimate universe where they're still teenagers kind of like this this teen romance type book and then Oh, how did I forget this one? Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, which, you know, there was a huge, like, emphasis on trying to revamp the Inhumans. And in my opinion, the only two characters to come out of that that are worth anything are our beloved Kamala Khan and Lunella Lafayette, the Moon Girl and her Devil Dinosaur. So she's got her own comic here. Like, sign me up. Son Lockjaw, do not ignore Lockjaw. Oh, the Lockjaw, joy yeah. of a giant dog is not to be underestimated, <laughs> hey, sir. Listen, I need I just straight up need pet avengers between Lockjaw, between Jeff the Land Shark, the Devil Dinosaur, Amazing Baby, like we just need pet avengers. Also, uh I'm I'm cheating here. I'm coloring outside the lines, but the last issue of the Thor comic, which is if you need any other reason, uh, Throg assembles essentially the pet Avengers. So go read Thor. Donny Cates and company are killing it. And I, I, I was nervous. I, like I said before, when I previously nerd commended it, I was nervous after that, that beautiful Jason Aaron run, which I don't know what he's doing on Avengers, but bless it. Um, I was really nervous about a new creative team. Um, so I, but th- that Thor title, good God, go pun intended. Good God, go read Thor. I can tell you've been living in uh, the southern portion of the United States for a while because you say something <laughs> bad about Jason Aaron, and you're like, "Bless it." <laughs> that's that's <laughs> southern. That's southern English. I always joke that I moved to the south and I went into foreign language because I needed a translator. But I'm 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 finding my way now. I think you've acclimated. Yeah, yeah, it's starting to show. <laughs> All right, that wraps up episode 77 of the Nerd by Word podcast. Special thanks to Mario Candelaria. Uh, Be sure to head to uh, Kickstarter here on November the 12th and support that project if you can. Um, And as always, we thank you so much for your support. And if you would do us the favor of a five-star rating and review on your favorite podcast platform, we're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the TuneIn Radio app, Amazon Podcasts, or nerdbyword.com. And of course, we want you to come at us, bro. So please, <laughs> at us. We are on Twitter and Instagram at the nerd by word, uh, at nerd by word and uh, individually at that nerd Chris and at that nerd Dave. We want to hear your comments. We want to interact with you, get your ideas for things we should talk about on this pod in the future. And if you just want to tell us that we kind of suck, then uh, we're, <laughs> we're there for that too. You just go ahead and shoot us some feedback. We want to hear from you. Listen, make sure you do that on the Instagram post because we've had some people get angry in our comment section, but the joke's on you because the more comments you have on an Instagram fo- post, honey, that's the higher it pushes up the algorithm. So thank you. Uh, but as always, <laughs> stay well and stay nerdy, my friends. The Nerd By Word is written and produced by Chris and Dave, two nerds with a love of all things pop culture. The podcast features music by Al Jimenez with additional drops composed by Joe Biondi. Our show art is by Ashery Design. Find us at nerdbyword.com and wherever podcasts are available. Mm-hmm.